Hello and welcome all of you. Today we are discussing the chapter Breathing and Exchange of Gases. In the previous chapter we have seen that we are all taking food to get our nutrients which are all used for body building, may be used for producing energy. So main purpose of food is for utilizing as energy source. How the energy is coming out of it? It is by simple oxidation. For this oxidation, most of the organisms require oxygen. Those organisms which are producing oxygen, which are producing energy with the help of oxygen, are called aerobic. They utilize oxygen. Whereas a very few, some bacteria and parasitic forms, does not require oxygen. They are anaerobic in nature. What is the advantage of aerobic oxidation? Maximum energy comes out of the food material. In anaerobic, only a small part of the energy is coming out, is released. Whereas in aerobic, most of the air, most of the energy is coming out. That is the advantage of aerobic. So they require oxygen. From where they get oxygen? Oxygen they get from the surrounding. In aquatic environment, water is containing dissolved oxygen. That oxygen is utilized by the aquatic organisms. Whereas terrestrial organisms take oxygen from atmosphere. We are all terrestrial and we take oxygen from atmosphere. To so understand that, we are all continuously requiring energy. Even when you are sleeping, our body activities are going on. So, energy is to be made available continuously. So, oxygen is also should be available continuously. So, we have to take that oxygen to the tissues. It's a complicated process involving a number of steps. This is what is now we are going to study. Okay. What is breathing in brief? We are having a mechanism of the exchanging of gases. Oxygen taken from the surroundings and utilized for oxidation. And as a result of that, carbon dioxide is produced. This carbon dioxide is to be sent out. So, we are taking in oxygen, carbon dioxide is sending. This exchange, reciprocal exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between organism and the environment is called breathing, which is also called respiration. Mechanism of breathing vary in different types of organisms, mainly depending upon their habitat. If they are all aquatic, it is from the water surrounding them. If it is terrestrial, it is from the atmosphere. So, mainly based upon their habitat. Then two, their grade of organization. In simple organisms, there is no special structure exclusively for exchange of gases. It generally occurs through the general body surface. So, for example, in protozoans, sponges, dendrites, etc., there is no special structure through which exchange of gases are taking place. It is occurring generally through the body surface. Whereas in others, which are all advanced, the body surface is not permitting the exchange of gases because the body surface may be very thick, hard, or even covered by coverings like cuticle. So in such conditions, the skin or the general body surface cannot act as the 
exchange surface in them there will be spatial structures for example in earthworm we are having the skin in frog also skin when it is in water it can act as the skin can act as the respiratory surface because skin is soft and glandular always wet so exchange is possible respiration taking place through the skin is called cutaneous respiration whereas in cockroach we have studied that the air is taken directly to the tissues through highly branched tubes called trachea that mechanism is called tracheal mechanism generally in aquatic animals you are having special highly vascularized structures called gills it is called branchial respiration okay and in terrestrial animals you are having lungs it is called pulmonary respiration so depending upon the environment that is the habitat in which they are living as well as the level of complexity you are having different types of breathing mechanisms okay now we are all terrestrial and are having pulmonary respiratory mechanisms our lungs are kept in the thoracic chamber now how air from atmosphere is entering into that for that there is a system of tubes through which air is taken into the lungs it begins from our external nostril which leads to a nasal chamber a nasal chamber open to the pharynx pharynx is the common chamber for both passage of food and passage of air see you are having a special feature in this is the oral passage and this is the nasal passage okay this oral passage and nasal passage are meeting at the common pharynx this nasal passage is having three parts one a vestibule to which the external nostrils are leading this part will be containing hairs small hairs and mucus secreting cells which produce mucus then there is another pair of structure which is called conditioner conditioner is that part of the nasal passage which will be warming up the air we are taking see air we take is cool our body is warm it should be brought to our body temperature then only exchange will be facilitated and water droplet moisture is to be added that is called humidification so filtration humidification and warming up are done by this nasal passage okay then on the extreme posterior part you are having the olfactory chamber this olfactory chamber is responsible for our smelling by which we will be smelling that chamber is having olfactory epithelium which is having 
sensory cells. Okay, so you are having a vestibule, a conditioner, and an olfactory chamber. This open to the pharynx. Mouth is also open to the pharynx. Pharynx is the common structure for both passage of food and air. That part of the pharynx to which the buccal cavity is opening is called oropharynx. That part of the pharynx to which the nasal passage is opening is called nasopharynx. Lying on the floor, there is a small slit. This slit is the glottis. It is the glottis. Glottis is the opening of a structure called larynx. Larynx is our sound box, okay, which is made up of nine cartilages. It is the voice box. The largest cartilage is the Thyroid. In males, the thyroid becomes enlarged and forms what is called Adam's apple. Adam's apple. It is to this cartilage that our thyroid glands are attached. Okay. This glottis is covered or by a cartilaginous covering. This cartilage covering is called epiglottis. This epiglottis prevents the entry of food particles into the trachea. Similarly, we are having a uvula, a muscular partition. This is called uvula. When food is coming in the form of a ball called bolus, what happens? This bolus will be pushing the uvula so that so that the uvula raises up and temporarily closes the nasal pharynx so that food will not enter into the nasal passage. Okay, the food is entering into the next part of the alimentary canal, that is the esophagus, through a vestibule or a gullet. So food is passing like this and the air is passing like this. So pharynx is having four parts, oropharynx, Nasopharynx, glottis, and a gullet that leads to esophagus. Okay, so presence of an epiglottis, a cartilaginous flap, covering and closing glottis is a characteristic feature of mammals. Okay, now glottis leads to the Voice box, larynx. Inside the larynx, you are having vocal cords. When air is pushed through these larynx, the vocal cords vibrate and their vibration causes sound production. So, air is pushed out, not taken in, during sound production. You can feel it. You place a hand when you are speaking, you can see that the air is coming out. And our nasal passage and the vocal and this pharynx can act as a resonating column that will be helping in altering the pitch of the sound, etc. Okay. Now, what is trachea? Trachea is the windpipe. 
windpipe is a straight tube extending on the ventral side through the ventral side okay extending through the ventral side and reaches the mid thoracic cavity to be precise at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebrae fifth thoracic vertebra it is dividing into a right and a left branch called bronchus plural bronchi so it divides into a right and left bronchus the trachea at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra dividing into right and left okay and entering into the lung after entering into the lung it is called primary bronchus so i am writing the order so we are having trachea trachea dividing into two bronchus after entering into the lung it is called primary bronchus okay primary bronchus divides into a number of secondary and each secondary again divides into a number of tertiary bronchi okay this tertiary bronchi will give rise to a number of branches which are called bronchioles the first bronchioles are called initial bronchioles and they end up in terminal bronchioles okay so trachea will be forming the primary i am mean, dividing into two bronchus that form the primary bronchus secondary tertiary bronchi initial bronchiole and these parts are supported by incomplete cartilaginous rings up to the initial up to the initial bronchioles you are having the wall supported by incomplete hyaline cartilaginous rings called cartilaginous rings each terminal bronchiole give rise to a number of very thin irregular walled and highly vascularized bag like structure called alveoli uh, from terminal bronchus you will be having alveoli a bunch of alveoli is called infundibulum it is called infundibulum it is a bunch of alveoli they will be having a duct which is called alveolar ducts thus the lung is made up of okay branching network of bronchi bronchioles and alveoli all of them are constituting our lung our lung is thus a spongy solid structure which is almost triangle shaped with a broad base which is resting on the diaphragm and the upper part the dorsal part actually it is the anterior part tapering tapering so each lung is a triangle shaped structure okay the right lung is a bit larger and is having three lobes the left lung is a bit smaller having only two lobes and in the left lung you are having a notch a depression the small gap between the right and left lung 
is called mediastinum. It is in this mediastinum. Heart is placed. The apex of the heart is tilted to the left side. And to accommodate the heart, you are having a small depression called cardiac notch. Cardiac notch. Now, the trachea, bronchi, etc. are lined by pseudostratified ciliated and glandular epithelium. It is made up of or lined by glandular as well as ciliated. These cilia and glands are helping in removing the dust particles. Okay, they are all helping in removing the dust particles. The lung is covered by a double layered pleural membrane. The pleural membrane has an outer and inner, outer tuff and inner pyrus layer. And it secretes small amount of fluid that accumulates in the gap in between. The fluid is called pleural fluid. In between the two layers of the pleura, this pleural fluid will be remaining and this pleural membrane and fluid will make the movement of the lungs friction free. Okay. The part started from the external nostril up to the terminal bronchiole, up to the terminal bronchiole, constitute the conducting part because its main function is to conduct, to take air into the lungs and out of it. That is why it is called conducting part. Whereas alveoli and their ducts, alveolar ducts, will form the respiratory part. Because it is only through these alveoli and their alveolar ducts that the exchange of gases are taking place. So it is also called the exchange part. Okay. Conducting part help in clearing air from foreign particles, that is, cleaning, humidifying, and also warming up. The exchange part is the actual site of diffusion whereby Gases are exchanged. Now, our lungs are kept in a thoracic cavity, which is an airtight chamber. This is an airtight chamber. In this thoracic cavity, on the ventral side, you are having the sternum. On the dorsal side, that is on the back, we are having the vertebral column. And on the sides, you are having the ribs. Ribs are on the lateral. Okay. And lower, that is posterior, you are having a dome-shaped diaphragm. So, that is the thoracic chamber. It is in this airtight thoracic chamber that the lungs are kept. The pressure in the thoracic chamber is always less than that of the atmospheric pressure. The anatomical setup of the lung in thorax is such that in the volume of the thoracic cavity, any change in the volume of the thoracic cavity will be reflected on the pulmonary cavity. If you increase the thoracic cavity, the pressure inside the lung becomes reduced. If you decrease the thoracic cavity, pressure inside the lung will be increased. So, it is inversely affecting the pressure inside the lung. A change in the thoracic volume is inversely affecting the pressure inside the lung. That is the mechanism. That is how they are arranged.
Okay. This arrangement is essential for breathing. Why? Because we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume. We cannot bring about any change in the volume of the lungs. Only through changes in the thoracic volume, we can bring about changes in the pulmonary volume. We cannot bring directly any change in the pulmonary volumes. That is the special mechanism by which our thoracic cavity is made. Clear? And in respiration, there are five important steps. One, regularly we are taking in air, giving out air. That is called breathing. Breathing is also called ventilation. What is ventilation? We are all taking atmospheric air to the lung and giving out the air from the lung. Okay. Second one. The air that is now reaching the alveoli is exchanged with the blood. The oxygen comes to the blood and from blood the carbon dioxide goes out. This is called diffusion. The diffusion that is occurring at the alveoli is the primary diffusion that is across the alveolar membrane. Now the blood is transporting to where it is reaching or it is transporting to every tissue of our body. And in the tissues, let us see what is happening. The oxygen in the blood is given to the tissues. Oxygen is given to the tissues. And from the tissues, carbon dioxide is entering into the blood. Taking of the respiratory gases between alveoli and tissue is called transportation. This is called transportation. The oxygen is transported to the tissues and carbon dioxide is transported back to the alveoli. So, third important event is transportation and once it reaches the tissue, oxygen is given to the tissue and carbon dioxide from tissue diffuses into the blood. So, again there is an exchange of gases. So, this exchange is called secondary exchange. Exchange at the tissue level. So, diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between blood and the tissues. Thus, once oxygen is reaching the tissues, tissues can utilize it for its activities, namely oxidation. That takes place inside the cells. That is why it is called cellular respiration. It is actually during this process that energy is released. This is what is actually called respiration. This is called also as internal respiration because it is inside the tissues that oxygen is utilized actually for production of energy and so is called cellular respiration or internal respiration. We are not studying that part, cellular respiration here because cellular respiration is same whether it is in plant or in the animal. We are all studying it in detail in Botany, the respiration mechanism, we are all studying in detail there. So, we need not discuss that part, but we are studying all other events. So, we are studying breathing, diffusion, transportation, and the second diffusion. Is that clear? Now, we go to
mechanism of breathing. Breathing is also called as external respiration, where actually there is an exchange of gases between the surrounding and the body fluids. How oxygen is reaching our blood and from blood how carbon dioxide is sent out. That exchange is called simply breathing. It consists of two processes. Taking in of air, that's called inspiration, and giving out is called expression. This inspiration and expression are carried by making a gradient in pressure between atmosphere and lung. If pressure is low in the lung, air from outside will come in. If Pressure in the lung is high, higher than that of the atmosphere. Air from lung goes out. So, that is the mechanism. By creating a pressure gradient, the air is made to come in and go out. How? Inspiration is taking place. This inspiration is occurring with the help of two sets of muscles. So, we can call them as Inspiratory muscles. What are these inspiratory muscles? Inspiratory muscles are mainly the muscle of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the partition that is unique for mammals that separate the thoracic chamber with that of the abdominal chamber. It is having a special set of muscles called phrenic muscle. This phrenic muscle is the muscle of the diaphragm. This is the most important. So it's called primary inspiratory muscle. Okay. Second set of muscle is the muscles present in between the ribs. This is called intercostal muscles. There are two sets of intercostal muscles. One on the outside, one on the inside. Here, it is the external intercostal muscle. Which is helping in inspiration. So, the second set of muscle that brings about inspiration is external intercostal muscles. Where they are, they are all present between the ribs. So, for example, this is the ribs. Okay. The ribs are attached with the sternum. Sternum is the chest bone. Okay. And in between the ribs, you are having the intercostal muscles. Understand? That is the position of the intercostal muscle. How many pairs? We are having 12 pairs of ribs and so we are having 11 pairs of intercostal muscle. 11 pairs. To begin with, a signal will come from the brain to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is remaining in the form of an arch structure. It is remaining as an arch structure. You can see it. Highly arch. It is dome shaped. When the signal reaches, the muscle contract. When this muscle is contracting, what happens to the arch shaped structure? See, diaphragm, which is arch shaped become lesser and lesser in length, smaller and smaller in length. So when it becomes smaller and smaller in length, it becomes less and less arch. And finally, it becomes straight. So when it is becoming flat, now there is an increase in the volume of the thoracic cavity in a antero. This is our anterior. 
and this is the posterior. Anterior posterior direction because the diaphragm has moved back towards the abdomen. Diaphragm is an arch structure when it is fully relaxed. It get contracted. For contraction, energy is needed. Okay. So, the diaphragm become flat, causing an increase in the thoracic volume in an anteroposteral direction. Now, the intercostal muscles, external intercostal muscles are contracting. When they contract, they become or they will be pulling the sternum upward and forward. The sternum, which was in this position, become pushed upward and forward so that there is an increase in the volume in a dorsal ventral direction. So, both antero posterior axis or in dorsal ventral axis, there is an increase in volume because of the contraction of these two sets of muscles. Clear? As a result, the total volume of the thoracic cavity increases. When the total volume of the thoracic cavity increases, pressure inside the lung decreases. When the pressure inside the lung decreases, we call it as a negative pressure is created. What is negative pressure? What pressure was that there in the lung become decreased by the pressure decreased because the thoracic volume increased. We have studied that any change in the thoracic volume will inversely affect the pressure inside the lung. So volume increased, pressure decreased. So when there is a fall in pressure, that is called negative pressure. Here yeah, from atmosphere automatically enter in. Thus, inspiration takes place. So, inspiration takes place because of a fall in intrapulmonary pressure, a decrease in the pulmonary pressure. A negative pressure was created with the help of these two sets of muscles. That is why we say that our inspiration is a negative ventilation. It is called negative ventilation. The contracted muscle will not remain so. It will come back to their normal position. The muscle will relax. When the muscle is relaxing, the flattened diaphragm become increased in length. So, when its length is increasing, gradually it becomes arch and fully arch. Finally, its length is reaching the maximum. It comes back to the normal arch or dome shape. So, it moves towards the thoracic cavity. So, that there is a decrease in the volume in the anteroposteral direction. Similarly, the Contracted external intercostal muscles relax. When they are relaxing, the sternum is coming back to their original position. Sternum is coming back. When the sternum is coming back to their normal position, what happens? There is a decrease. Okay. There is a decrease in this thoracic cavity in a dorsoventral in a dorsoventral direction so there was a decrease in volume so decrease in volume in anteroposteral now decrease in volume in a dorsoventral direction so overall volume of the thoracic cavity decreased whenever volume is decreased pressure in the lung is increasing the thoracic volume decreased means it will have a negative effect on the pressure inside the lung. Pressure inside the lung becomes higher, greater than atmosphere, so air goes out. That is expiration. So, 
both inspiration and expression are occurring with the help of diaphragm and external costal muscles. Okay. We have the ability to increase the strength of inspiration and expression with the help of additional muscles in the abdomen. We are having abdominal muscles and another set of intercostal muscles called the internal intercostal muscles. These two sets of muscles, internal intercostal muscles and abdominal muscles will be used in labored breathing when you are all making both inspiration and expression. See, normally, inspiration alone requires energy. It is active. Expression is passive. Normally occurring without any expenditure of energy. But you can make expression also active by contracting the muscles of the abdomen and internal intercostal muscles. So these two muscles are called expiratory muscles. Normally we don't use these expiratory muscles. What are these? Abdominal muscles and external intercostal. They are also present between the ribs. External intercostal muscles. These two are all expiratory muscles. We don't use these external intercostal muscles or abdominal muscles during normal breathing. But by using these, we can bring about change in breathing pattern, increase the strength of inspiration and expiration. Normally, we breathe 12 to 16 times per minute and the volume of air involved in breathing movements are all measured by a small instrument called spirometer. A pulmonologist will use this instrument to measure these volumes which are all of clinical importance and he will identify whether your lungs are healthy or not based upon these things. Okay. And the data that we get from that spirometer, what is the spirometer? It is simply a tube which is connected to your mouth and you are all asked to blow. At the other end of that tube, there will be a meter. Okay. And a small ball will be moving up and down through a meter, a graduated scale, which will be giving the indication of how much air you are all breathing in or breathing out. That simple instrument is called spirometer. And a pulmonologist will get these values measured. These values are called the volumes and if these volumes are plotted in the form of a graph we get which is called a spirogram this is the spirogram we get four volumes only volumes we will be getting directly from that instrument. Okay, so what are these volumes? One, the normal volume of air that we will be taking in during a normal breathing is equal to the normal amount of air that will be breathing out. Inspiration is equal to expression. This volume is called tidal volume which is 500 ml. But we can take additional volume by a deep breath after a normal inspiration. Additional volume of air you can take. That additional volume is called inspiratory reserve volume, which is 2500 to 3000 ml. This graph is not in our books. Okay. Similarly, even after sending out a normal volume of air, so for example, I have sent out the air, 
but I can also send additional volume of air. All of you can do it. That additional volume of air we can send out is called the expiratory reserve volume. Even after sending that expiratory reserve volume, there is some amount of air that is remaining in the lung. Okay. That air nobody can send out. It is called residual volume. Residual volume is 1100 to 1200 ml. So only these volumes will be getting directly from a spirometer. This graph is obtained by plotting those values in a graph. And from these volumes, we get, we calculate and get capacities. What is a capacity? Capacity is obtained by adding two or more volumes together. We never get it from the spirometer directly. We have to calculate. Capacities are obtained by adding two or more volumes together. For example, this is the volume you are normally taking and this is the volume that you can additionally take. So this is the total volume from A to C. You can take in total which is called inspiratory capacity. That is your capacity for inspiration, IC. So, IC is 3000 to 3500. Clear? Now, this is the volume you normally breathe out, but additional volume you breathe out. Okay. This is the total volume one can breathe out after a normal inspiration. This is called expiratory capacity. So, TV plus ERV is EC. This is 1500 to 1600. After a normal expiration, there is an amount of air remaining. A part of it you can send out, other you cannot send out. This is the total volume of air that is remaining in your lung after a normal expiration. This is called functional residual capacity. This includes air that you can send, that is ERV, and air you cannot send, RV. So ERV plus RV is FRC. Now, the total volume of air you can send out after a deep inspiration, after a deep inspiration, you will be sending out that additional volume you have taken, normal volume of air that will be normally sending out, plus additional volume that you can send out. So, from A to D. This is called vital capacity, which include IRV plus TV plus ERV. So, IRV plus TV plus ERV. It is also, see, what is IRV and TV together? It is IC. So, IC plus ERV. Or, what is ERV plus TV? EC. So, EC plus IRV. This is the volume of air one can send out after a deep breathing. It is also the same amount of air one can breathe in after a forceful expiration. Both are same. And still, there is small amount of air we have not considered, which is remaining in the lung. So, vital capacity plus that ERV, to that is called total lung capacity. That is almost 6 liters. 5,100 to 5,800 5, ml. Is that clear? So, these values are of clinical importance. A doctor, a pulmonologist will measure these values and he will assess the functioning and the healthy of nature of your lung based upon these values. Is that clear? 
So that is about the respiratory volume and capacities. Now, after reaching the alveoli, what happens to these gases? Gases are exchanged. See how this exchange is taking place. The exchange is taking place simply by a pressure gradient. It is by diffusion, no other mechanism. It does not require any energy. It is simply along a gradient from a region of high partial pressure to a region of low partial pressure. Gases are exchanged. Understand that. In atmosphere, we are having different gases. Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and rare gases are there. And the percentage of oxygen is almost 21%. Almost. The 760 pressure is the pressure of the total gases present in the air. And the pressure only because of oxygen is called its partial pressure. We write it as PO2, partial pressure of oxygen. How you calculate partial pressure? What is the percentage? So for example, we are having 760 as the pressure. You take it. 760, 21 by 100. That is the 21 percentage. You will be getting the partial pressure 159. Okay. And in the alveoli, there is some amount of air always remaining, which is very rich in carbon dioxide because it is remaining in the tissues. So it is rich in carbon dioxide. So when we take air, about 500 ml of air, into the lung, which is generally having almost 2 liters of air, FRC, our air becomes diluted in such a way that its composition changes in such a way that partial pressure of oxygen decreases, partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases. So, when it reaches the alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen becomes reduced to 104. This is the reason why partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is reduced because the inhaled air, small quantity, 500 ml, is mixed with 2000, almost 2 liters of air that is already remaining in lung. So, this alveolar air is exchanged with the blood reaching with the lung. What type of blood is reaching? It is the impure, deoxygenated. That deoxygenated blood is having only 40. Partial pressure of oxygen is 40. So there is a deep gradient, 104 to 40. So because of that pressure gradient, oxygen will come diffusing. And the conditions, conditions are ideal for diffusion. See, diffusion of gases will be depending upon three important things. What are they? One, the pressure gradients. That is what we have now discussed. Second one, solubility of the gas. Oxygen is having more solubility than nitrogen. It is having twice the solubility than that of nitrogen. Three, the diffusion membrane. What is the diffusion membrane? The diffusion membrane is made up of three layers. The alveolar air, which is having 104 partial pressure, is separated from the blood reaching the alveoli, which is the blood, it is the venous blood, deoxygenated, which is having only 40. Okay. We are having three layers separating these two gases or these two media. One, it is the endothelium of the blood capillary. Then, 
They are having squamous epithelium of the alveolar wall. Both of them are thin, flat. Alveoli, as well as endothelium, are having thin, flat squamous, which will be allowing exchange of material through them. That way, they are all present in such specific areas where exchange is occurring. And these two are connected together by the basement substance. So, squamous epithelium of the alveolar wall, then basement membrane, then three endothelium. These are the three layers that oxygen has to cross if it is to come from alveoli to the blood. Though it is made up of three layers, the combined thickness is very, very small. It is less than one millimeter. So, diffusion membrane is very thin. So, because of these three reasons, a gradient, solubility, and thickness of the diffusion membrane, oxygen can easily diffuse. As oxygen comes more and more diffusing to the blood, what will happen? Oxygen partial pressure in the blood increases and finally it reaches 95. By that time, it has become arterial blood, oxygenated blood. There are two reasons for that. Oxygen is coming. Second one, carbon dioxide has diffused out. So carbon dioxide level in the blood decreased, oxygen level increased. Is that clear? How the carbon dioxide is diffusing? We will be discussing now. So let us understand. It is the arterial blood which is having a partial pressure of 95 that is taken to the tissues. So it reaches the arterial blood is reaching the tissues. In the tissues, what is the condition? You are having more carbon dioxide and oxygen is continuously utilized. So the partial pressure in the tissues is less. In blood, you are having 95. In tissues, it is only 40. So, from 95 to 40, the exchange will take place because of that gradients. Remember, capillaries are also having endothelium. The tissues having only very thin cell wall or that is cell membrane actually. So, you are having only a very small diffusion membrane through which oxygen will be diffusing from the arterial blood to the tissues. Clear? Now, come to the history of the diffusion of carbon dioxide. How this carbon dioxide is exchanged? Let us see. Carbon dioxide is produced in tissues. So, its partial pressure is very high in tissues. It is 45 and the blood that is reaching the tissues is arterial blood which is having only 40. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood is just 40. So, in tissues 45, in blood 40. So, there is a gradient. You may say there is only a small gradient. Why? But that is sufficient for carbon dioxide. Why? Because carbon dioxide is having 20 to 25 times more solubility than that of oxygen. So, even a small partial pressure is sufficient for carbon dioxide to diffuse. Carbon dioxide is 20 to 25 times more solubility. So, from 45 containing tissues to the blood, arterial blood, carbon dioxide is coming. Oxygen is diffusing to the tissues. Now the blood becomes venous. So in venous blood, the partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing to 40. From 95, it has decreased to 40. And that of the carbon dioxide has increased from 40 to 45. Clear? It is that venous blood that is reaching the alveoli. In the alveoli, see, carbon dioxide is 
present in the venous blood 45. What is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in alveoli? Just 40. So, there is a gradient difference in venous blood 45, inside the alveoli 40. So, because of the gradients, the gas diffuses. So, we are having <coughs> conditions which are all always favoring the diffusion of gases between alveoli to blood and from blood to tissues. Okay. All factors in the body are favorable for the diffusion of oxygen from alveoli to tissues and that of carbon dioxide from tissues to alveoli. Now, we have studied that diffusion is the only mechanism by which gases are exchanged and for diffusion no energy is needed. But now let us study how these gases are transported. Blood is the transporting medium which carries both oxygen and carbon dioxide. And first coming to the transportation of oxygen. Oxygen is transported in two different ways. One, in a physical form, that is, oxygen will be soluble in the water of plasma. So, in a dissolved form, 7 percentage is, I mean, 3 percent is transported, whereas, most majority of the oxygen is transported in a chemical form. 97 percent is transported in a chemical form with the help of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin will be combined with oxygen in a reversible form to form oxyhemoglobin. But there must be certain conditions to satisfy the association of oxygen and hemoglobin. One, there must be sufficient pressure for the Oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen should be sufficient, then only oxygen will be combining with hemoglobin. Okay. So, oxygen and hemoglobin combined under pressure. And in the alveoli, partial pressure of oxygen is sufficient to cause the combination. One molecule of hemoglobin, which is present in RBCs, See, you are having large number of hemoglobins in each and every RBC. That hemoglobin is the coloring pigment that gives red color, which is having iron in a ferrous form, Fe2 form. It can combine with maximum four moxen molecules. Hemoglobin can combine with a maximum of four molecules of oxygen. Binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is related to the partial pressure and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, hydrogen ion and the temperature or other factors. And the relation between hemoglobin and oxygen can be charted in the form of a graph called oxygen dissociation curve. This curve is called Oxygen dissociation curve. Okay. See, all the factors which are all present in the alveoli are favoring the combination of oxygen with hemoglobin. So, what is the condition in alveoli? Let us see. Partial pressure of oxygen is very high. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is very low. Hydrogen ion concentration is Hydrogen ion concentration is very low. Hydrogen ion concentration low means pH high. pH high means alkaline. The blood is slightly alkaline. And temperature is also low. We know that when temperature is high, 
the components. A chemical will be breaking into its components. In alveoli, as air is coming and going, ventilation is going on, the temperature is comparatively less. Partial pressure of oxygen is very high. And under this condition, slowly hemoglobin will take one by one. And finally, it becomes fully saturated, meaning all the four oxygen molecules are attached to the hemoglobin ions. And one hemoglobin can carry about 1.34 ml of oxygen. Okay. So, carbon dioxide pressure low, partial pressure low, hydrogen ion concentration also very low. This is the reason in alveoli, hemoglobin and oxygen is combined to form oxyhemoglobin. So, all factors are favorable for the formation of oxyhemoglobin. But in tissues, the condition is not the same. In tissues, partial pressure of oxygen is very low, whereas partial pressure of carbon dioxide is very high. Hydrogen ion concentration also high. Hydrogen ion concentration high means pH low. pH low means acidity. The blood is becoming more acidic. Temperature is also high. So, when temperature is also high, any chemical will break. So, oxyhemoglobin breaking in tissues because of the four conditions. Mainly, there is carbon dioxide more. And carbon dioxide will cause a retardation or reduction in the affinity of hemoglobin with oxygen. So, when the affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen is decreased, one by one, oxygen is removed from oxyhemoglobin. So, the curve will be moving to the right. This shift in the curve to the right is called bore effect. What actually is the bore effect? When there is carbon dioxide, the affinity with hemoglobin and oxygen will be very much reduced. The hemoglobin will be having now reduced affinity with oxygen. So, instead of having 100% saturation, it will be now having 70%, 60%, etc. So, as the carbon dioxide concentration increases, partial pressure increases in tissues, the affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen become decreased correspondingly. This effect, negative effect of carbon dioxide in the relation between oxygen and hemoglobin is called Bohr effect. Bohr effect occur in tissues. So, this diagram, this graph, which is obtained by plotting the partial pressure of oxygen and percentage of saturation, which is called oxygen dissociation curve, is a sigmoid curve. If you gradually increase the partial pressure, the affinity increases and more and more saturation occurs. And once all the four oxygen is taken, it becomes fully saturated. The hemoglobin is fully saturated. That's why it reaches a flat. Okay. Maximum saturation, 100% saturation is occurring. Remember, almost at 97 partial pressure, 100% saturation of hemoglobin is occurring. And we are having 94 to 97 percentage of saturation occurring in our normal living conditions. See, there is small amount of carbon dioxide there also. Okay, so because of that, oxygen is almost 100 percent saturated here. Okay, thus 97 percent is transported in a chemical form. Only 3 percent is transported in a Dissolved form in a physical form. Clear? Thus, 
most of the oxygen is transported in a chemical form and on which the tissues what is the condition there is more carbon dioxide because of that carbon dioxide the affinity between oxygen and hemoglobin is decreased so one by one oxygen is released and that oxygen goes to the tissues and 100 ml of arterial blood can deliver 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues every 100 ml of oxygen and blood can deliver 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues under normal physiological condition clear that's about the transportation of oxygen now coming to the transportation of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is transported in three different forms what are they one in a physical form remember carbon dioxide can combine with water will be forming carbonic acid so about 7% of carbon dioxide is transported in this way in a physical form two carbon dioxide can combine with amino group of proteins rbc is having hemoglobin hemoglobin is having amino group so carbon dioxide will be combined with the nh2 group and will be forming hb nh coh carbon amino hemoglobin and about 23 percent is transported on average that means majority of them are transported in the form of bicarbonates in a dissolved form 7 percent is transported in the plasma 23 percent in a chemical form that is in rbc so rbc is capable of transporting both oxygen and carbon dioxide and third one bicarbonates how in the form of bicarbonates it is transporting bicarbonates are the main type of 70% of carbon dioxide how it is taking place the carbon dioxide from tissues first dissolves in the water of plasma but it will be dissolving more in the water of rbc because in rbc as well as in plasma there is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase so under the influence of this carbonic anhydrase it will be dissolving in water forming h2co3 it is forming carbonic acid carbonic anhydrase is present both in plasma and rbc but more in rbc so more reaction will quickly occur in rbc this will immediately cause a split that will be ionizing that ionizing is also brought out by the carbonic anhydrase so bicarbonate ions are formed this bicarbonate ions diffuse out of the rbc and will be combined with the sodium there and will be forming sodium bicarbonate so it is in the form of sodium bicarbonate that most of the carbon dioxide is transported in plasma this is also in plasma clear now this sodium bicarbonate on reaching the alveoli comes back to this reaction is completely reversed and come back to the original and is splitting into sodium bicarbonate is splitting into bicarbonate ions which will be entering into the rbc and from rbc they are all diffusing into the alveoli and the splitting of carbon dioxide from blood that is 
blood is transporting plasma the rbc is having bicarbonate ion which is entering into the plasma and forming sodium bicarbonate which is a stable compound why this stable sodium bicarbonate is splitting as it reaches the alveoli it is because of another effect called haldane effect haldane effect there's a change in ph that change in ph of the blood is the reason why bicarbonates are splitting so when bicarbonates are splitting we will be having carbon dioxide released so bohr effect occurring tissues haldane effect occurring alveoli and during the transportation of carbon dioxide in form of bicarbonate as bicarbonates are exchange between rbc and plasma to maintain the ionic balance chloride ions are passing from plasma to rbc so there is a reciprocal exchange of chloride ions and bicarbonate ions between plasma and rbc this is called chloride shift or hamburger shift chloride shift okay chloride shift is the reciprocal exchange of chloride ions for the exchange of bicarbonate between rbc and plasma so at the tissue site where partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high due to the catabolism carbon dioxide diffuses the blood rbc and plasma and forms bicarbonate and hydrogen ion at the alveolar site where partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low the reaction proceeds in the opposite direction meaning splitting of the h2co3 forming carbon dioxide thus carbon dioxide trapped as bicarbonate the tissue level and transported to the alveoli is released as carbon dioxide every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood can deliver approximately 4 ml of carbon dioxide now how our respiratory activities are controlled we are having a center in the hind brain in the medulla oblongata which is called respiratory rhythm center this respiratory rhythm center is responsible for the control of activities of the respiration okay so you are having a center called as first center first is the medulla called rhythm center that is responsible for this regulation from that a signal comes then only the phrenic muscle will contract there is another center in pons part pons is situated a bit higher than it is a part of the cerebellum okay which is called pneumotaxic center this pneumotaxic center can bring about minor changes that is called moderation in the functioning of the respiratory rhythm center this neural signal from this part can reduce the duration of the inspiration so what is the time you need for inspiration that is under the control of pneumotaxic center which is located in the pons part that it can alter the respiratory rate a third center called chemosensitive area is located very close to the rhythm center which is sensitive to carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions okay so whenever there is a change in carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion in the body they will be activating the centers and in turn can signal the rhythm center they will send this message and give the information to the rhythm center so the rhythm center will bring about changes and thus the signal from the rhythm center will be altered to make necessary adjustment in the respiratory process okay 
we are also having hemosensory structures along the artery coming to the head carotid artery and the aorta the main blood not in the walls of the vein there are present on the artery aortic arch aorta and carotid artery which are all also sensitive to carbon dioxide and hydrogen concentrations they will understand changes whether your body is having normal or abnormal level of hydrogen ion or carbon dioxide level and they give the message to the rhythm center and the rhythm center will understand and will make adjustments thus our body is bringing about regulation of the respiratory activities and in that regulation oxygen is having no role our body is insensitive oxygen is having no role the role of oxygen the regulation of respiratory rhythm center is insignificant okay and coming to the last part namely the disorders of respiratory system what are the disorders one asthma it is difficulty in breathing asthma will be difficult in breathing causing wheezy and it is due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles during asthma the muscles of the bronchi trachea etc will be undergoing irregular contractions and that causes expiration difficult okay emphysema is a condition in which alveolar walls are damaged see it is through the alveolar walls that exchange of gas are taking place but it become damaged and fibroid and become unfit for exchange of gases so the respiratory surface is decreased and smoking is the main villain in convert the normal healthy alveoli into emphysemic alveoli so when the total surface area of exchange is decreased the availability of oxygen become very much reduced and occupational respiratory disorders meaning if you are all continuously exposed to some situations which will be forcing us to breathe those materials which are present in the atmosphere tiny things continuously for a long time they become accumulated in the lung and the lung will make a covering of mucus thick mucus around them to get rid of that irritant chemical or material so after prolonged years of exposure to the same situation our lungs become very much reduced in surface area because of the deposit of these materials the alveolar walls become unfit for that exchange so long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis the alveoli become fibroid it become thick and fibrous tissue become abundant so it become unfit for exchange and thus causing serious lung damage all of the mark called occupational lung disorders which is correctly also called as pneumoconiosis pneumoconiosis it may be because of dust particles sand grains or cement particles or pollutants maybe because of coal particles tiny dust particles coal particles when they were all working on coal mining areas or in boilers so all such things will be inhaled so what is the best method use protective mask and covering so that the air will be filtered before they enter into our respiratory tract and with that we come to the conclusion of the discussion of the topic breathing and exchange of air so thank you all we will be meeting again with another chapter next time till then take care and goodbye